Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Eric Peterson. Um, I am actually a postdoctoral fellow at UCSD and in my real job I uh, do computational and theoretical neuroscience. In the process of doing that I've actually done a fair amount of machine learning on neural data. And so this talk is going to be basically two parts. One, a quick whirlwind tour of snippets of machine learning if you're not at all familiar. And then two, sort of the title of the talk which is trying to convince you that there's a difference between predicting something and understanding something. And that when you go and do any kind of machine learning you should be very clear on what your intent is. Do you just want to build a prediction machine or do you actually want to understand what you're putting into the model and what it's giving you? They don't have to conflict. They often do. You can actually make them sort of join together but often requires doing a lot of work and knowing ahead of time that that's what you want to do. So what do I mean by prediction? Okay, before I start, who's a programmer in here? Has anyone done any machine learning at all? Okay. Um, that's about what I want to know. Okay. So if you worked at Google or Facebook, you'd want to use machine learning to try and predict whether someone would like a post or what they'd search for next as two examples. And you'd be really shooting for making the performance of your model, which is classification accuracy, get better. And you define ahead of time what accuracy is and your sole goal, focused engineer that you are, would be to make that number improve. You futz with your model, you futz with your data, iterate until it improves. If you do science though, it's very rare we have a single metric that defines success. We're usually looking at more diffuse questions, but we're always looking in terms of experiments. You do experiments because you actually want to understand what's happening. So if I do machine learning on neural data, I'm trying to like, can I make them remember more by actually doing something to them? Or maybe in a little more civic-minded sense is, can we use all the data we have and machine learning in large and mass, not specifically, to try and learn what that data means and change people's parking behavior, which is just different than changing where they park. As in, we don't do anything to the system, we just want to know through time what will happen. Before we can get to that though, because I didn't know what the mix was, this is the quick whirlwind tour of machine learning. Here is a very small list of a whole lot of terms that if this was a real proper long-winded introduction to machine learning, I would talk about basically the entire talk and would really need a week, really a year to unpack in any kind of meaningful way. So I'm going to sort of let these linger here for a moment and then show you a couple quick examples, a couple quick important pieces of jargon that you'll see if you start looking in any of this. And then we'll kind of switch back to what that means for the topic. And so the six, if anyone in the world who does this kind of stuff were to make a list of the number of things you have to do to do machine learning, it would be anywhere between one and 10 items. And so this is far from canonical. It's just the way I've kind of broke it down. It basically is you get some data and you gotta clean it up. Because no matter where you got your data from, it's going to contain a bunch of stuff that you don't want. If it's a website you acquired from the public, it's going to contain a lot of stuff that you don't want. If there's a web form, for example, and people are typing into it, you're going to get the range of answers you were looking for, and then God knows what else. And you need to get rid of God knows what else. Now that you've cleaned your data, you need to figure out what you want from it. Sometimes you're very lucky and you can just start throwing data into a model and it works. Most of the time you're going to have to do some averaging, some condensation, some pre-processing, some extraction to try and make it in a way that's workable. Having done that, can't see it, it's so small, you go about building your model. And this is what everyone thinks about is machine learning. And then there's supervised and unsupervised and regression and classification and then this massive zoo of possible models you could build. And knowing which ones to use, because there's never a right one. The only thing they've actually proved with, with machine learning is that there is no best one. It's a frame called no, the no free lunch theorem. 
It actually proves that there's no one true optimizer, but machine learning systems are just optimizers. So it's always the question of, well, which one should I use? And if you have a lot of domain knowledge, you might be able to guess well. If you're sort of, well, you've got all this data from the city. We don't know what we're doing. It's going to be one of the things you're going to be basically flinging things at it until something works. And you can do that safely because of how you design your scoring and your generalization, which are the next two things. It's to say, you have a model. It learns some stuff. How do you measure what it learned? Other thing, a lot of these systems, this nice laundry list of jargon here, are really good at learning structure in data, at learning patterns. They're so good, in fact, they'll learn the noise, too. And so you can learn a model that's very specific to this one data set, and the next time you put new data into it, it just completely explodes, or fails catastrophically, or does something else wonky you did not at all expect. Which is why there's this whole suite of tools that basically test model generalization. And this is generally what you'll hear is called cross-validation. This is basically everything. You mess that up, your model's not going to predict anything in the future. And then having done all this other list of things, which might be really easy if you know what you're doing and you get lucky, or it might take a really long time as you iterate through to try and understand how all these steps interact, because they will, you then go, well, it works. But it's huge and complicated, and I don't know how we got here. So then you go about throwing parts out and trying to refine it to make it simple. So let's be concrete. Here, no, I have to wonder. This is a problem. Okay, here are three example data sets. They're kind of hard to see because the default plot colors are terrible in Matplotlib, but this is a set of red points and a set of blue points. You can see they're kind of overlapping circles. This one, a blue surrounded by red. And this is basically red next to blue with some overlap, but fairly vertical. This is going to be a problem. One way to find structure. So this is, we made this data up. We know what the right answer is. And so we can then throw algorithms at it and see what they do, which is a great way to understand, well, what they do. This is an algorithm called k-nearest neighbors. This belongs to the class of models of unsupervised learning algorithms, which is to say it doesn't know anything about this redness and the blueness in the data. Right? We pretend that our data is from two labels, red and blue, which in this case are meaningless and abstract, but they could be left or right, correct or incorrect, parked, not parked. Ticket, no ticket, whatever. This case, the algorithm actually uncovers the structure of the data, not knowing that red and blue are a thing that exists. It's not quite that simple, because it didn't even know there were two things. They probably started with there's one thing and 20 things, and you try all possible blobs and through a process called hyperparameter optimization, which is a big buzzword to say you randomly try things and then you use cross-validation to make things generalize properly. Anyway, option two, supervised learning. So this, the model knows about redness and blueness. It's just trying to find a way to linearly, because this is a linearly <coughs> supervised classifier, to put a line through it. When you put a line through data that is basically has a line through it, it works really well. This is scoring 97%. When you put a line through data that is some overlapping circles, it does really poorly. So it's 90, which actually isn't that poor. And if you put a line through two overlapping circles, it performs at chance, which is what you'd expect because you've divided two circles in half. So you hope when you start this off, and I'll get back to this later, that your model's linear, that you can use linear terms, because it buys you some really nice things, both performance-wise and understanding-wise. But often it's not. And then you bust out non-linear classification, which you can see learns to divide up the data that's difficult, but also does pretty well at the one that had a line. Though if you'll notice, we dropped about half a percent. And then this is another way to do nonlinear classification that I don't want to get into because it's a massive pool. 
I'm actually going to skip that. So this is term boot camp just so I can say what I need to say. You want to learn more? Andrew Ng's Coursera course is absolutely amazing. The link at the bottom is the link. So this, when it's taught on Coursera, is very high level, has a ton of lessons. We'll get you up to speed if you want to learn. This set below it is actually the link to his notes from the when he teaches it at Stanford, which is taught at a much higher level. So if you want to see the math underlying it all, it's all living here. And it's actually really nicely laid out. It requires appropriate background for it. But it's, it's really nice. And then I prefer Scikit-Learn, which is a Python toolbox for doing machine learning. There are a slew of alternatives. Their documentation is where I stole all those initial images from. And they have a great set of tutorials for both introducing the zoo of things you can do with machine learning with nice pictures and with fake data sets that you can play with to start to understand how they all work. Um, and then finally, the, the bottom link is a very long paper from, from the ACM on how to do, well, I mean, it's labeled feature selection, which is the process of picking out data from your larger pool. But it is, in and of itself, an outstanding general introduction to how to think about designing a machine learning analysis in much greater detail than I could go into here. But as I said, all of this, I should tell this, all of the, I don't want to go all the way back. The big list of all the jargon is the pipeline. It's the plan. It's the thing you want to do. Before you can even do that, you need to ask yourself one really important question. Am I building a black box? Or am I trying, awkward to stand over there, coming back over here. Am I building a black box? That is to say, I want it to predict red and blue from the data I give it, and I don't give a crap how it gets there. Which incidentally is all of the deep learning networks that Google and Facebook are having so much success with, they are deeply black box. No idea what it actually learns. When you teach DeepMind to learn Atari or the other things to learn internet cats really well, how that got accomplished, the people who made it don't have any idea. The skill they have is in constructing an artificial network, not in understanding that network. Which is amazing if all you want to do is classify internet cats. And I shouldn't say all you want to do, because that was like 20 years of the culmination of their field to classify. Like, they can classify thousands of natural image categories. That's crazy. But they do it in a way that we, we don't know what happened as we got there. Which isn't to say there are people actively working on that, but the fact that it's a new, difficult, and completely unsolved field pretty much tells you what you need to know. Second thing is, I'm a scientist. I like to do machine learning so I can design the next experiment. But if you want to influence government, policy is an experiment. Trying to, do, trying to use a model to just say whether there will be a pothole or not is very valuable. Trying to build a model to influence when they get filled is, can be a very different thing. And now I'm going to give you an example from neuroscience, because you made the mistake of bringing a neuroscientist into the room. So this is what you get. You get brains. You get a very specific, very weird kind of brain image, which is something that we call bold. And it's acquired on an MRI. If you've ever had your knee broke or shoulder messed up or whatever, they take you into the big cylindrical magnet thing. It goes doom, 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 doom really loud at you for 10 to minutes to an hour, and then out comes some grayscale images. Through the magic of science, we can convert those grayscale images into a measure of brain activity. That's a brain. I've now chopped that brain up into what we call voxels, which are really just pixels that are compressed three-dimensional images. You put your brain in the tube, you take pictures, the picture actually represents a depth, although the image is just a TIFF image. And so when you acquire a set of brain data, if you think of each cube, each pixel, 
from the brain as a separate dimension, which is what a lot of people do, there are 262,144 dimensions in this data set. I'll typically have 100, 200, 500 examples of time points for a 200,000 dimensional data set. That's what we call the curse of dimensionality, which is to say, you have so many more dimensions that you have data that, well, the problem's really hard. And what you're most likely to do, unless you're very careful, is learn noise. And so, people in brain land have worked out ways to do this. And I'm gonna show you two of them. One, where they took a very black box approach and just said, let's predict the brain gambling. That's to say, let's take all the brain data we have, all 200,000 voxels and 200 examples of each, and predict whether the person won or whether the person lost. And after what was probably two or three years of a graduate student's life, they produced these nice colored brain images you see here. What these images are showing you is the brain activity or I should say classifier performance of brain activity for wins in orange versus losses in blue. They took the brain in mass here. If you wanted to say, okay, let's stimulate a person's brain, which is a thing we can do, and change their gambling behavior. I do this professionally, and the description I would give to you of this is, there's a lot of blobs on the brain. I don't know which ones are more important in changing the behavior. I don't even know which ones to pick to try because you can't see it, but like 30% of the brain is important in doing this prediction. They were like the, the conjunction was was like tiny. It, there was like two little areas in temporal cortex that that overlap. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember. I'm sure. I don't. I don't think it was. Um, but they succeeded admirably because they could predict from these whole brain data sets, like 85, 90%, whether someone won or lost. So they're doing a great job reading these people's brains. Just can't do anything with it from a scientific point of view. But they succeeded. But blindly succeeding always has a risk. And this is why you may doing the kind of work a lot of the people are talking about doing here, you get the data you get and you don't get to go again and acquire more, which is the way it is. Doesn't mean you can't still use models to influence. But if you take a massive amount of data that Maxim dumps onto a thumb drive for you and you're like, here's a million rows of city data, go predict parking violations. You'll, you, I guarantee you, with a lot of data, you'll succeed in predicting something. But you can wind up predicting something that's completely and utterly meaningless, as these fine researcher at Carnegie Mellon did in 2007. They held the brand, Grand Brain Machine Learning Challenge. And they got engineers from Carnegie Mellon, and, and they said, use all of your prowess, here's this brain data, build a predictive model. And they succeeded really well in terms of accuracy and all their scoring. All they predicted though, the most important voxels are in the ventricles. You see the little outline in red here? And you'll notice the most salient thing about the ventricles is there's absolutely no brain there. It's full of spinal fluid. And so they succeeded in building a machine learning algorithm, which they properly did cross-validation for. They designed the model properly. And the most predictive part of the model had absolutely no brain in it. And they later, after a lot of work, tracked down a bias in the scanning procedure as the data was collected. So they actually detected variation in very expensive instruments at two different sites, but didn't collect anything about the brain. 
So this is my woo scary warning about doing blind machine learning. You need to know your data. Okay, second example. This is patient HM. In the 1950s, he had surgery for epilepsy, I should say. He suffered for 20 years of seizures, so he couldn't live any kind of normal life. And they finally, in what was essentially a very experimental procedure, cut out a region of his brain called the hippocampus, just sort of in the middle, shaped like a seahorse. When they did that, HM could no longer navigate properly, but more importantly, he couldn't form new memories at all. From the day he woke up from his surgery, he remembered nothing. But he remembered his past basically perfectly well. If you gave him an IQ test, fine. It was just like he was before. He simply couldn't remember anything new. And that taught us, and then 50 years of follow-on research confirmed that the hippocampus is a key structure for memory. So let's say you want to decode memory. You could then throw out all the brain data and look only at the hippocampus. And then you know you've picked data which is directly relevant to what you want to predict. You also know because the importance maps, which are the, the degree of colors, which is which voxels are more important in making the classification decision, tend to cluster in meaningful anatomical places. And actually, the reason that is, is because they went further. They took the hippocampus, which they knew was important, and then they took their data and chucked it into two pools. The first pool they used to basically go nuts doing feature selection, which is they went and found just the very few voxels. Let's say there were 500, which is probably not a terribly wrong number. And they found 30, which were most predictive for the memory task they gave the person. Then they took the location of those, and then they popped it over to the other data set. And then they tested the algorithm there. And the reason they did that is because you want to avoid what's called double dipping, which is if you select on your data and then try and predict on your data, you're going to put a positive bias in your analysis. And so you're going to think you're doing really well when all you've done is, is you know, bias the system so heavily towards what you found the first time. And so, this is the counter case of not only did they start somewhere they knew something about, they then went very carefully to find very specific locations so they could then make specific tests later on. Of course, the downside of that is they didn't get to learn anything new. It could be that there was another part of the brain that was really important in this task that they would have discovered and they did. Which is the trade-off of you can do both these things. That's the great part. You can, if you know where you're going, be very focused. Sidebar, dispatch a second grad student or employee or volunteer, depending on where you live in the world, and, and take both approaches. But that's boring because it's better if you could just get everything you want all at once. Because there doesn't have to be a trade-off. There just often is. And frankly, there often is because this is a very young field, and I'm saying this to the camera, no one really knows what the hell they're doing yet. Despite the early success, very young, still figuring things out. The first thing you need to have, if you're going to try and do both, is a very clear goal of what you want your model to accomplish. It is super easy to get a bunch of data, open up scikit-learn, and start classifying the crap out of it. And you'll almost wind up learning nothing except learning the scikit-learn API really well. I say this because I've done this, and I'm telling you, you'll think, I have a clear goal, and then you'll woke up six months later, and you now have learned a great deal about classifying data in Python and have no firm conclusions to draw because you didn't know, have a clear goal in mind. And if you start off with a ton of city data and no very specific ambition with that data, you are going to wind up in that place, which is saying, understand your data. Don't just chuck it into the algorithms and let the machine learn. Because the machine will learn what you give it. Which is the classic garbage in, garbage out. Equally true here. You do that by making many, 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 many plots of your data. 
There are lots of great exploratory data analysis tools that help you do that. You want to do this step. Or you won't, and you'll try it, and then you'll learn why you want to do this step. Because you'll wind up doing what the nice people in Pittsburgh did, which is classifying noise. Secondly, when you play with your data, you're going to start to, if you ever do any of this, look at something you call collinearity. Which is to say, if you have 200,000 <coughs> dimensions, rows, pieces of data, a whole bunch of them are going to be related to each other. And if you start throwing a whole bunch of data that's related to each other in a classifier, the classifier is going to be underdefined. And it's going to start doing very, very wonky things, with some exceptions. But by and large, you want to refine your data down so that it's relatively independent, if possible. And if it's not, you need to know that, because you need to plan for it. Secondly, seek domain knowledge. Unless there is no domain knowledge, then you can't do that. Thirdly, try the linear models. If you start reading this stuff, you'll be like, oh, there's, I can go use random force with Adaboost, and it'll be great. But then you'll wind up with models you can't interpret. Linear models, which are just models that draw lines through data, and it'll be a plane if it's two dimensions or three dimensions, and then a hyperplane if it's four dimensions of data, and then a hyper hyperplane if it's six dimensions of data. I don't know what it's called. But it's just drawing lines through things. We know how to interpret drawing lines through things. And the weights the model will give you directly represent how useful the features are. And it's easy to reason about. They'll run really fast, usually. If you can't build a linear model, try and look for a nonlinear model that has interpretable weights. Some nonlinear models, you can't make heads or tails out of the scoring system it develops. It'll give you a very meaningful prediction, but you can't decompose the model. Others, my favorite being random forests, allow you to rank the weights, to understand the weights, to begin to figure out what's important in the model. Part of that, too, if you can interpret it either because you're in a linear space or because you've made a good model choice, if you can get away with it, you're going to wind off with, wind up, you're going to start with a million rows of unknown city data. Your ambition, if you want to understand what that data means, should be to get rid of it as much as possible. Most of that data isn't going to help you. People are like, big data. Big data is great if you don't know what the hell you're doing. If you know what you're doing, you really will need a very small of data. And I have a great argument for that in just a second. Making your data smaller, feature selection. Secondly, thing called sparse models, which is these will algorithmically try and throw your data out and will only keep the most meaningful, most predictive components. Uh, a great example of that is the lasso, which also has the property of regularizing the weights, which will prevent the overfitting, the fitting the noise thing. A technique called regularization will help fix that, which sounds complicated. But all it does is make it so that when you change the parameter in your model, it can only take tiny steps. Because if all you can do is take tiny steps, you can't fit noise, because it'll just get washed out. Which brings me to the final point of a lot of data is really great if you have no idea what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, you really only need half a second of data, and you can change our understanding of the physical universe. This is the data from LIGO, which a couple days ago was published. This is a gravity wave detection experiment. Einstein, way back when, 1910, whenever, he was developing relativity, imagined space as basically a spread bendable bed sheet. It's just deformable. A consequence of that is if you had two bowling balls on a tight bed sheet, you had them rotating, you'd see the bed sheet make waves. They predicted waves would happen. They've been trying to get them for 15 years actively, longer than that since they made the prediction. It's been 10 years of immense effort of a lot of physicists trying to do this. But in the end, with half a second of data, they confirm that space is, in fact, a wibbly wobbly sheet. They also, because they use two black holes, which are rotating each other a billion years ago, 
because light travels at a finite rate, and they're really far away. So we observed two black holes a billion years ago rotating each other. From the spacing in here and the variance here, they figured out how much those black holes weigh and how fast they're rotating, as well as other physical properties about them, from half a second of data. They only did this because they have extraordinarily good theory, which is what I'm trying to say is big data is great when you're struggling to understand something. Your ambition is always to have just the right data that answers the question you want to ask. Because we're, I'm, maybe you're not, slow creatures sometimes. And it's easy to think about small things. It's hard to think about big things. In summary, figure out what you want to do and figure out how much you know. You answer those two questions before you open up your Python interpreter, your Spark interface, whatever R, whatever you're using. Have these two in mind before you do anything and you will be much happier. Thank you. <laughs>